On a cool March night in Southern California, just shy of midnight, Ace Hopewell rode his motorcycle through a narrow canyon north of Los Angeles, the engine's low rumble echoing off the deserted cliffs. He glanced over at the looming concrete face of the St. Francis Dam, illuminated by the moon, an imposing structure rising high above the canyon floor. As he passed the dam, something about the stillness made him uneasy. But having traveled this route countless times before, he pressed on without giving it a second thought. Suddenly, a deep roar reverberated through the cliffs. Jolting to a stop, Ace swung his leg off the bike, set the kickstand, and stood quietly, trying to make out where the distant rumbling was coming from. Lighting a cigarette, he scanned the steep hills for falling rocks, dust clouds, anything that could indicate a landslide common to the mountainous terrain. The darkness revealed nothing except the faint smell of disturbed earth and an even fainter sound of rushing water. Assuming he was out of harm's way and that the noise was from a landslide elsewhere, Ace felt relieved. Still, something didn't sit right with him. As restlessness crept over him again, he flicked the cigarette away and continued on, oblivious to the dire reality unfolding behind him. Moments after Ace passed by, water began surging over the top of the weakened dam, tearing cracks wider with each surge. Chunks of concrete broke free, collapsing down the dam's facade and littering the valley floor below. Soon, the full weight of the dam gave way, crashing downward and unleashing a rising, unstoppable flood barreling toward thousands of unsuspecting, often sleeping families below. The story of the St. Francis Dam begins not with concrete and steel, but with the insatiable thirst of Los Angeles. By the early 20th century, the city was growing rapidly, swelling from just over 100,000 residents in 1900 to more than half a million by the 1920s. This explosive growth was fueled by the promise of land, opportunity, and the allure of California's sun-soaked prosperity. But there was one problem, water. Los Angeles' natural water sources couldn't keep up. The city was desperate for more water, leading officials to look elsewhere for the liquid gold. These efforts would be driven by the ambitious and sometimes ruthless William Mulholland. The California Water Wars, which had raged in the Owens Valley, were key to understanding why the St. Francis Dam was even considered. In an effort to secure water rights, the Los Angeles Aqueduct Project diverted water from Owens Valley to the city, sparking outrage among local farmers and ranchers. Yet even this wasn't enough. The aqueduct, completed in 1913, needed additional reservoirs to stabilize the flow and store excess water for drought periods. San Francisco Canyon, where the dam was eventually built, had long been a site of human activity. The canyon, carved by the San Francisco Creek through the Sierra Polona Mountains, had been part of key travel routes for centuries. Spanish missionaries, Mexican Californios, and gold miners had all left their mark on the area. By the 19th century, it served as part of the El Camino Viejo, an important route between Los Angeles and the San Joaquin Valley. The canyon's rugged beauty and strategic location made it an ideal candidate for a large reservoir. Mulholland first considered the site during the construction of the aqueduct, believing that a reservoir here could safeguard Los Angeles' water supply in case of drought or damage to the aqueduct. The narrowing of the canyon downstream and the wider upstream platform seemed perfect for a dam. The site was chosen not just for its topography, but also because the land was federally owned and inexpensive compared to other potential sites like Big Tujunga Canyon. Construction on the St. Francis Dam began in 1924 with little public attention, in part to avoid sabotage by Owens Valley residents still bitter over the aqueduct. The dam was modeled after the Mulholland Dam, completed just a year earlier with modifications to suit the new site. Built as a gravity arch dam, it stood 200 feet high at completion. However, Mulholland's experience in concrete dam construction was limited, being a self-taught civil engineer. And despite geological concerns, construction pressed forward under his supervision. Geological tests conducted before construction revealed differences in rock formations. The western hillside was made of relatively stable conglomerate and sandstone, but the eastern abutment consisted of schist, a softer laminated rock prone to faulting. Mulholland acknowledged these concerns in 1911, but ultimately dismissed them, relying on his belief that the dam's weight and design would ensure stability. The dam took shape over three years, with crews pouring more than 175,000 cubic yards of concrete. As construction progressed, the dam's height was raised several times, ultimately reaching 185 feet above the canyon floor. This expansion required the addition of a wing dike to contain the reservoir's growing capacity. By May 1926, the dam was complete, capable of holding 12 billion gallons of water. The opening of the dam was understated, reflecting its utilitarian purpose. 
On March 12, 1926, water began filling the reservoir. By March 1928, it was nearly full. As the second largest reservoir in the Los Angeles aqueduct system, the St. Francis Dam significantly increased the city's water storage capacity. Power generation at the site soon followed, helping to fuel the city's rapid expansion. At first glance, the dam appeared to be another triumph of engineering, standing as a silent guardian over the lifeblood of Los Angeles. The St. Francis Dam held back billions of gallons of water, creating a critical reservoir for the growing city. From the moment water began filling the reservoir on March 12, 1926, the structure began showing troubling signs. Cracks emerged almost immediately, spreading across the face of the dam as the reservoir rose. Initially dismissed as normal settling, these fissures deepened over time. Workers patched and monitored the leaks, but by late 1928, landslides near the eastern abutment raised further concerns. Still, officials remained confident. The dam had survived its first full reservoir test, and that was enough to quiet concerns. Throughout its short service life, notable incidents hinted at the dam's instability. Vertical cracks stretching from the top of the structure to its base were identified and inspected by William Mulholland and his team. Although Mulholland judged them to be typical of large concrete dams, seepage from the western abutment near the San Francisco fault line persisted. Workers attempted to seal the leak, but water continued to trickle through the face of the dam. In April 1927, the reservoir level rose to within 10 feet of the spillway, and by May, it sat within three feet of overflowing. Mulholland, however, remained unconcerned, famously calling the dam the driest he had ever built. By February 1928, the water level had reached just a foot below the spillway. Seepage increased, and new cracks appeared in the dam's wing dike. Near the end of February, a significant leak developed at the base of the west abutment, discharging roughly 4.5 gallons of water per second. When the leak doubled in size, Mulholland ordered an 8-inch concrete drain pipe installed to direct the flow. Despite the alarming sight of water cascading down the dam's abutment, Mulholland continued to insist the structure was safe. On March 7, 1928, with the reservoir three inches below the spillway, Mulholland ordered no further water to be added to the St. Francis Dam. Five days later, dam keeper Tony Harnischfeger discovered another new leak at the west abutment. Concerned by the muddy appearance of the water, an indication that the foundation might be eroding, he alerted Mulholland. After an inspection, Mulholland and his assistant Harvey Van Norman determined that the discoloration came from loose soil disturbed by a nearby road and concluded that the dam was secure. Only hours later, disaster struck. At 11.57 p.m. on March 12, 1928, the St. Francis Dam catastrophically failed. There were no surviving eyewitnesses to the collapse itself, but at least five people had passed the dam within an hour of its destruction without noticing anything unusual. The last, a carpenter at the dam named Ace Hopewell, rode his motorcycle past powerhouse number one 10 minutes before midnight. Hearing a low rumbling sound from the hills, he stopped to investigate but saw nothing amiss. By the time he left, the dam had already begun to fail behind him. A sharp voltage drop at 11.57 p.m. signaled the collapse. Seconds later, a wall of water exploded from the reservoir, sending a flood wave more than 120 feet high surging down San Francisco Canyon at 18 miles per hour. Entire settlements were swept away in seconds. Powerhouse number two, one of the first structures in the flood's path, was obliterated along with 64 of the 67 workers and their families who live nearby. The flood would continue west, following the Santa Clara River Valley and devastating multiple towns along the way. As 12.4 billion gallons of water began surging downstream, entire communities were in the path of total disaster, hundreds of people unaware of the rapidly approaching demise. The initial response was chaotic. At 11.57 p.m., a transformer station near the dam failed, cutting power to parts of Los Angeles. It took nearly an hour before dam keeper Tony Harnischfeger was confirmed missing, and the full scale of the disaster began to sink in. The dam's failure sent a wall of water, mud, trees, and boulders rising up to 150 feet, crashing down the San Francisco Canyon into the Santa Clara River Valley, clearing a two-mile-wide swath of land 70 miles long, and eventually emptying into the Pacific Ocean near Oxnard, nearly 54 miles downstream. For those living within the first 18 miles of the dam, any warning or potential evacuations were just not possible. However, downstream communities benefited from heroic efforts that saved many lives. Night operators at power and telephone utilities remained on duty, notifying communities further down the flood's path of the incoming danger. Local police and fire personnel quickly mobilized, racing up and down the valley to alert residents. 
Neighbors helped spread the word and individual acts of courage were common. In one town, over 100 residents gathered on a bridge to witness the flood, only to be hurried off by police moments before the structure was obliterated. Despite the lack of a coordinated response plan, first responders and telephone operators demonstrated remarkable bravery and initiative. Still, many communities were left in darkness, unsure of where to go or how to escape. In the aftermath, once the floodwaters began to recede, makeshift morgues were set up along the flood path as search and rescue efforts began. Survivors clung to debris pulled from trees and rooftops, while emergency workers and volunteers combed through the wreckage for days. Despite efforts, many bodies were never recovered, lost to the Pacific Ocean. The final death toll is estimated to exceed 431, making it the second deadliest disaster in California's history, surpassed only by the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The flood also left hundreds more homeless, destroyed 900 houses, and swept away 24,000 acres of farmland. The investigation that followed was swift and expansive. With unprecedented speed, eight investigations began by the weekend following the collapse, with at least a dozen in total. Governor Clement Young appointed renowned dam engineer John Wiley to lead one of the most prominent inquiries. Other notable investigations were carried out by the Los Angeles City Council, the County Coroner's Office, and the District Attorney. Additional panels included independent engineers like Dr. Bailey Willis from Stanford and Carly Grunsky, a former president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. The Santa Clara River Protective Association and the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors would also launch separate inquiries into what happened. The Governor's Commission met on March 19th and released their findings on March 24th, just 11 days after the disaster. They concluded that the dam's foundation rested on unstable rock formations that had been overlooked during construction. The western abutment, in particular, sat atop a reddish conglomerate that softened when saturated with water, leading to the collapse. The commission stated, the ultimate failure of this dam was inevitable unless water could have been kept from reaching the foundation. Although William Mulholland accepted full responsibility, he was cleared of criminal wrongdoing. However, his career effectively ended in the wake of the disaster. The coroner's inquest also pointed to critical engineering oversights, with the jury recommending that no single engineer should bear sole responsibility for major dam projects in the future. The collapse had national implications. At the time, Congress was deliberating the Swing-Johnson bill, which aimed to fund the construction of the Hoover Dam. Concerns about dam safety threatened to derail the bill, but it ultimately passed and was signed into law by President Calvin Coolidge in December 1928. Diverging theories emerged during the investigations. While most commissions agreed the failure originated at the western abutment, others, including Willis and Grunsky, believed the eastern abutment played a role. Willis highlighted evidence of an old landslide beneath the eastern section, which may have contributed to the collapse. Grunsky suggested that hydrostatic uplift destabilized the dam's base, exacerbating its structural vulnerabilities. Today, the St. Francis Dam site stands as a quiet ruin, a scarred reminder of the catastrophe. Large chunks of weathered concrete and rusted handrails are all that remain, scattered along the creek bed south of the original site, slowly being reclaimed by the earth. The area is registered as California Historical Landmark Number 919, marked by a plaque near San Francisco Canyon Road. In 2019, the John D. Dingell Junior Conservation Management and Recreation Act established the St. Francis Dam Disaster National Monument, preserving 353 acres of land. Guided tours and interpretive signs recount the tragic events of that fateful night. The disaster left an indelible mark on civil engineering, prompting stricter regulations and reshaping the design and oversight of dams across the United States. The collapse of the St. Francis Dam serves as a sobering reminder of the delicate balance between human ambition and nature's unforgiving power. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end of the video. If you found this story interesting and want to explore other historical people, places, and events, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. I'd also love to hear from you. Drop a comment below telling me which topics you'd like me to cover in future episodes. I'm trying to build a community around these videos, so any thoughts on topics or ways to improve the videos are more than welcome. Your support makes this channel possible, and I'm so excited to continue sharing incredible stories with you.